adore him. <laughs> Let's hear his adorable voice. We'll, uh, if you'll stay standing, we'll read from Luke 21, verse 5 through 11. In your Pew Bible, that's page 1050, if you'd like to refer to that, a passage that we've uh, heard for several weeks now, and we continue to plumb the depths of it. So follow along with me. And while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, as for these things which you are looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another which will not be torn down. They questioned him, saying, Teacher, when therefore will these things happen, and what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See to it that you are not misled, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. Then he continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes and in various places plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. Well, this morning we are in Luke chapter 21 once again. No surprise there. We are going verse by verse through the book of Luke. And we find ourselves in a section where Jesus tells us about his own second coming. And he tells us specifically some events that precede that coming. He calls them birth pangs in Mark's account and in Matthew's account. That term is not used in Luke's account. But these are birth pangs that are going to precede the culmination of when he comes again to the world. That is our hope. That is our hope. A lot of people trying to figure out why we're here and what is the purpose of life and where is life headed. A lot of people, philosophers, have been trying to figure that out for a long time. People ask that question all the time. Why are we here? Why are we on this planet? Um, and what is the meaning of life even? And you've heard some of the views that people have. The Everything in history is just cyclical. It's just repeat, repeat. These things happen, they happen again and again and again and again. History just keeps repeating itself, but it goes nowhere. It's, that's all it is. A continuation of repeated events going nowhere. You read Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes, that's the cynical mind right there in Ecclesiastes. Nothing new under the sun, right? Life is empty, vanity, uh, no purpose. Just all these events randomly happening over and over again. Um, and then you've got those who see history as linear, and they're saying it's not necessarily all these repeated events, but it's headed in a, it's, it's, it's linear anyway. Uh, they would just not say it's going anywhere. It's just moving along. And they would say that, like uh, Dawkins, for example, he would say that even the evolutionary model has, uh, doesn't have any kind of long-term goal. It's just cruelty, really to be here and be going nowhere and have no reason for even being here. And uh, that's why the second coming is so exciting because it tells us the biblical view of history, that God in eternity past began story. History is his story. He wrote the story. He created the story. And he is bringing the story to pass and carrying it out. It had a clear beginning, it has a clear ending, and it's going to culminate in the revelation of Christ's return. Um, because we are significant in the universe, we're not the most significant beings in the universe, but we are significant, we were created by God, and there is certainly a plan, and... Um, the central figure of everything is Christ, and he came the first time in humility. He came the first time to die for the sins of his people, to rise from the dead, to give them eternal life, to, to take away the sting of death like we sang about, 
and then he's going to come again one day, come again not this time uh, as a lamb, but as a lion of the tribe of Judah. He's going to come back as a judge, and he's going to come back to establish this kingdom, this day of God when God will reign on this, <clears throat> on this, in this world. Um, preachers ignore this topic. A lot of churches don't even talk about the second coming of Jesus anymore. As we become a more secular culture and further away from the Bible and the Bible's influence becomes less and less in our culture, people don't talk like this and, and thus we're left with just nothing, no purpose, no direction, no reason for being here. It's just a cruel joke. But that's not how the Bible sees it. We say Jesus came once, Jesus is coming again. He told us when he left, he would be back again. And we look to the day when he will return and establish that kingdom. Pastor Steve Kreloff cited an article. I went back and read it. An article to illustrate our yearning for the second coming. I thought this was pretty interesting. He talked about the dilemma of the Bolivian Navy. You know where Bolivia is? South America. Next to Brazil, Chile, Peru, sort of sitting in there. He says it's the dilemma of the Bolivian Navy because Bolivia is a landlocked country. They have no coast. They have 3,000 men and women in their navy, but they don't even have access to the ocean for this navy. But they have a very enthusiastic navy. You read the article, they train. They train, they march, they practice all these exercises that a Navy would do, um, they, but they have no port, no access to the sea. They lost it. They used to have it. They used to have a coastline, but in the Pacific War of 1879, Chile took it away from them, and now they're landlocked and no access to the sea. But hey, they haven't given up. They haven't given up. It has become and has been, this article says, a national obsession looking to the day when they will have a coastline again. They have a day called the Day of the Sea. It's a parade and even a beauty pageant called Miss Coastline. <laughs> because they're living in anticipation. Even, people even have visions of a Bolivian coastline. And they look forward to the day when they will one, once again have this coast again. And the Navy is just part of that. We believe it's going to happen and we're going to be ready. And uh, there's no concrete plan to get it back, by the way. No concrete plan whatsoever. And you and I would look at that and we'd say, well, that's really foolish. That is really foolish because they er absolutely yearn for it, and, and we can applaud their yearning, but it's, it's misdirected zeal in a lot of ways. And that's how a lot of people view you and I as believers, as you and I talk about yearning for the second coming of Christ. They would say, we're foolish. We're foolish to think he's going to come again. Because, look, it's been 2,000 years. Uh, and you look just as silly as the Bolivian Navy without a seacoast. Scoffers will come, Peter told the churches. Turn to Second Peter for a moment. Second Peter, hold your hand in Luke 21. We'll be back. But in Second Peter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, just let me read this to you, these seven verses, eight verses here. He's just gotten through in chapter 2 of 2 Peter talking about false teachers. And one of the things that those false teachers will do is in chapter 3, they will scoff and mock 
the second coming. Notice in verse 3, know this first of all, 2 Peter 3, verse 3, know this first of all that in the last days, by the way, last days are the days that we are living in right now. Those are the days from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. That's the last days biblically, these last days. Mockers will come with their mocking. And notice, <laughs> notice why they're mocking, following after their own lust. They have an agenda in their mocking is the point that Peter is making here. Because you see, they want to live any way they can. They want to. And so they mock and ridicule this idea that Jesus is going to come back because they recognize that inherent in the doctrine of a second coming, there is divine judgment. That it's going to be the lion of the tribe of Judah that comes not a lamb the next time. They choose their own lust, and they don't want any accountability. They don't want any doctrine of hell or judgment of God or wrath of God. They take all that out of their sermons because they want to just live and be accountable to no one, and no one especially God. So what you do to get rid of that is you just deny it. You mock it, even though 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 says, when the Lord is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, he will deal out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. So the way they deal with this, these mockers deal with this or deal with the second coming is they mock it, deny it, say it will not happen because they want to follow their own lust. Verse 4, back in 2 Peter, they say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. See, their line of reasoning is, Things have always been the way they are, and they never will change from the beginning. God has never broken into the world and done something supernatural before. Everything's uniform. It's always been the way it is, and God has never broken into history before. Life just goes on. And what Peter is going to show, their line of reasoning is faulty. He says, when they maintain this position, it escapes their notice, verse 5, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water and through which the world at that time was destroyed being flooded with water. So he cites two things from the Old Testament, two events from the Old Testament where God intervened, where God did something supernatural in the world. He created the world, says in verse 5, in verse 6, he destroyed the world in a flood and judgment. He's judged the world before. Point is, he will judge it again. So Peter cites those supernatural events when God did enter the world. Verse 7, but by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire. Sounds just like the Olivet Discourse. Sounds just like the book of Revelation. Very consistent message in the Bible regarding the events surrounding the second coming of Christ. By the word, the, pr the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. His point in saying that is that time is meaningless to God. It's not, you can't put God on a timetable. You and I live in time. But God is not on that kind of timetable. He's an eternal, infinite God. But he's not slow about his promise. He hasn't forgotten about his promise. Verse 9 says, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish. There are still the elect who need to come to Christ out there. He is patient in bringing them into his kingdom. Everybody that he's 
chosen before the foundation of the world to be in his kingdom, have not come to him yet. He wants them to come to repentance. Verse 10, and I want you to notice that word day of the Lord in verse 10. He calls this the day of the Lord, this judgment by fire on the world, the second coming of Christ. He calls it the day of the Lord. It will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. He calls that event when Christ comes back in that judgment and all of the surrounding birth pangs and judgments of God by fire from the heavens and all of the things that you would, if you took the time, and I say do this, read in the book of Revelation, casual reading, don't take anybody else's spiritualizing of the, of the, of the, of the, of the book of Revelation, and that's exactly how it's described in Revelation. It's future. It's future. These things have not happened yet. The word day of the Lord, as opposed to, get this, as opposed to the day of man. We are living now in the day of man. We are living now in the day when the prince of the power of the air has a tremendous influence. And man is in rebellion to God. Everybody does what is right in their own eyes. One day it will be the day of God, the day of the Lord excuse me, the day of the Lord, when he will come and have his day. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let me show you something by way of introduction to Luke 21 this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This word, day of the Lord, is used about four times in the New Testament. It's used 14 times in the Old Testament. It means the same thing. There's coming a time that will be the day of the Lord. But notice Paul speaking to the Thessalonians in 1 Thess chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. In other words, I've explained a lot to you already about this speaking to the Thessalonians. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. That is Olivet Discourse language right there. Just like a thief in the night. A thief does not call you up and tell you I'm coming by tonight. You don't know. While people are saying peace and safety And that's exactly what false teachers do, by the way. Peace when there is no peace. God is not a God of judgment. God is not a God of, there's no hell. You know what makes the gospel really good news? It's because the wrath of God is so absolutely horrible. That's why the gospel is such good news. And you've always got to tell people the wrath of God that awaits them if they reject Christ and die in their sin. It is a horrible, horrible consequences for sin. And the only way the gospel is good news is, the only reason the gospel is the gospel, which means good news, is because hell is so horrible. And I want to be delivered from that wrath to come. The ungodly, those who reject Christ, will face the wrath of God. There's eternal life and there's eternal hell. If it's eternal life, then it's eternal hell. Follow me? If you're going to use eternal in front of life and you're using the same word in front of hell as he does in Matthew chapter 25, it's forever. That is horribly bad news. That is horrific and makes the gospel really good. Make sure people understand that. Make sure people understand why they would want to be saved. 
Let, let me read to you some Old Testament passages that use day of the Lord. Listen to these. Isaiah 13, 6. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Notice, this is coming from the Almighty. This is a supernatural a supernatural act of God on the world. Folks, there are, there are already judgments built into life. What you, sow, you, what you sow, you reap, right? You do something bad, you, you're going to reap consequences. That's built into life. There, there, are, there are horrible storms and horrible earthquakes and horrible things like that in life. These are just living in a fallen world. Those are built into nature, to the natural world. God is sovereign over all of them. He's designed the world like that. But I would not say that's supernatural. That's just natural. God's designed it that way. But what I'm talking about here is a supernatural intervention into the world when God comes in judgment on the day of the Lord. Let me read you another one. Isaiah 13, 9. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. Listen, cruel with fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation and he'll exterminate its sinners from it. Jeremiah 46.10, for the day belongs to the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, so as to avenge himself on his foes, and the sword will devour and be satiated and drink its fill of their blood and slaughter. Joel 1.15, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Joel 2.11, the Lord utters his voice before his army. Surely his camp is very great, for strong is he who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Joel 2.31, the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Zephaniah 1.14, near is the great day of the Lord, near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord, in it, in it the warrior cries out bitterly. It's a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, of darkness and gloom. Listen, the Bible is consistent. I, I'm reading that same stuff in the Olivet Discourse. I'm reading the same stuff in the book of Revelation. We just saw in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, this day of the Lord, a time when God will pour out his wrath on the earth. And I told you last time, I believe Revelation 6 through 19 is that event, that event, the day of the Lord. And it's all future. And it all parallels the Old Testament. It all parallels the Olivet Discourse. Because in that, Revelation 6 through 19, you have birth pangs until you get to chapter 19 when Christ comes back. The same structure of the Olivet Discourse, all these events, wars and false teachers and persecutions and all these things, and he comes back. That's a teaching of the scripture. So in Luke 21, that's what Jesus is doing. We're looking at some of those birth pangs <clears throat> that precede his second coming. I believe this is day of the Lord stuff. I'm reading to you. I'm teaching you. Right now, I don't believe it's the day of the Lord. I'll explain that to you in just a moment because certain events haven't happened, but birth pangs are like that. It gets worse and worse and worse and worse until the event. They get more intense until the event. And that's what I call birth pangs. We have wars now. We have earthquakes now. We have false teachers now, but it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. If anything, Luke 21 is telling us the world is not going to get better. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. It's terrifying. It is terrifying. But I believe our hard hearts need to be terrified. I'm not talking to Christians, but to unbelievers. Terrified. So that you will fear God and turn to the only one that can protect you from the day of wrath, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. People aren't terrified because it's not talked about, because they've 
mock it because they excuse it by their own lust because they denied it. I want to tell you something. If there's no day of the Lord, if there's no wrath of God, we don't need Jesus on a cross. We don't need a gospel. You don't even need to be here this morning. If there's no wrath of God. Because salvation is about being rescued from the wrath of God. Are you still in 1 Thess 5 by any chance? Were you ever in 1 Thess 5? Because I want to say something here that I don't have time to explain this morning. I'm going to say it, and in a few weeks from now, I'll try to explain it to you a little more depth. But it is my view that Christians will not go through the day of the Lord. If you are in the church of Jesus Christ, when the day of the Lord begins, when you are, if you are in the church of Jesus Christ and you belong to him, you will not go through the terrible events of Revelation 6 through 19. I say that because in the previous verses to 1 Thess 5, Paul tells the Thessalonians about a snatching away of the church, about a snatching away of those who are believers prior to chapter 5 that talks about the day of the Lord. It's called the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church. And I'm going to show you in a couple of weeks or when I get to this, the rapture of the church is different than the second coming. The rapture of the church does not have judgment associated with it at all. No judgment associated with the rapture of the church. No, so, no, no Jesus coming back to earth and establishing a kingdom in the rapture of the church. That is an event that precedes the pouring out of God's wrath on the earth. Well, I whet your appetite for that one. Because quite frankly, as a Christian, I believe in the imminent return of Christ. And I believe the rapture is imminent. I don't, I don't have any, any signs for that. I do have signs and birth pangs for the second coming of Christ. Well, that's not what we're talking about. Go to Luke 21. Luke chapter 21. We started talking about these birth pangs last week. And the first one we talked about, and this is Jesus giving, he's answering their questions. What signs? What sign of your coming? What sign of your coming back to be Perusia, Perusia to be the, the Messiah, to be the, the king of the whole world? As it talks about in Zechariah, that was their eschatology. Messiah would come and be the king over the whole world. Oh yeah, there would be some chaotic events that surrounded that. But they're thinking, here, here. Let's do it now. And what's going to be the sign of your unveiling, your revealing yourself as that king? They didn't know about a second coming. They didn't know about that. Just thought it was one coming, first coming. So anyway, he says there's going to be false teachers, false, pro false messiahs. People are going to be misled. We saw that from verse 8 last week. That's one of the, the uh, birth pangs. We see that today. It's going to get worse in those times, especially when people are trying to explain what's going on. People are going to be asking questions and looking for answers. And false messiahs will rise up just as they do today. And we talked about some of those last time. It will rise up. And people will be led astray. If you don't know God's word, you are prone to be led astray. You can be easily led astray. Even Christian radio can lead you astray. So much interesting doctrines, doctrines on Christian radio. That's the first one. We talked about that last time today. Notice he says in verse 9 of Luke chapter 21, and you're going to hear wars and disturbances. Do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. 
So there's going to be wars and there's going to be disturbances. Let's take the wars. And it says, don't be terrified. It's a very terrifying world we live in. It's easy to be terrified, isn't it? It's very easy to be terrified. There are all the different wars and all the different disturbances happening around the world. Wars, verse 10, is further explained a little bit. Verse 10, then he continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And I would tell you this, that that is just dominating the news all the time, right? Some nation attacking another nation, uh, wars everywhere. The, the whole of human history has been war, civil wars, ethnic wars, border wars, genocide, world wars. That is the history of mankind, wars. Uh, when there's peace, it's just because everybody's reloading, right? Yeah, it is. Just they're reloading. Steve Lawson says something humorous. He said a World War general was saying to his a World War I general was saying to his superior, he said, This is really a funny war. Muslims will not fight on Friday, Jews will not fight on Saturday, Christians will not fight on Sunday. His superior said, We'll find people that will not fight the other days and we'll solve world peace. <laughs> That's a good statement. That's wars. One commentator compiled the following. Listen to this. Before the time of Jesus Christ, historians recorded about 75 significant wars. That's before the time of Jesus. 75 significant wars. Now, now he's not talking about just conflicts and rebellions and small clashes and things like that. You know, they, they go on every day. But just significant wars, only 75. Or 70. He says... That was before Christ. In the thousand years after Christ, 50 wars of significance. 50 wars in a thousand years. In the next 500 years, 100 wars. In the next 300 years, 250 wars. In the last 200 years, 500 wars. 20 wars in the last six or seven years. 20 to 25 wars. You get the picture. Escalating, 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 escalating. Birth pangs growing and getting more and more intense. That's what Jesus is saying. Turn to Revelation 6. I just want to parallel it because I believe strongly the Olivet Discourse parallels Revelation 6 through 19. And, and that's the most controversial section of Revelation, as I pointed out last week. Some believe it already happened in the past. Some believe it's just historical stuff about the church. But I commit to you and, and challenge you, just read it and tell me that stuff already happened. And tell me when it happened. And you've got to do a lot of spiritualizing to make it say it's the history of the church. This is Revelation 6, 1 through 4. This is the beginning of the tribulation. Revelation 6, verses 1 through 4. I'm just going to give you an example of war, escalation here. That's what I'm doing, okay? From the book of Revelation. Then I saw the Lamb, this is Jesus, break the seven seals. He takes, he takes the scrolls, he breaks the seals. That's a Roman scroll, seal after seal after seal, break it. Seven seals, seven bowls, seven judgments are coming. But the point is this, and he says, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, come. All right, I want you to notice one thing important here. This is divine initiative. What is about to happen is horrible for the next 13 chapters. But it's by divine initiative. This is God doing this. God starting it, getting it rolling. Because why? This is the day of the Lord. This period of time. This epic. This season Because what is about to be described is sent from heaven. Not just man against man, but the starting events of this tribulation. A period of time that the world has never seen. Notice what it says 
in verse 2. I looked and behold a white horse. You immediately think when you read that, oh, Jesus is on the scene and a white horse. No. No. This is the false Christ. This is not the true Christ. This is someone imitating Christ. He comes on a white horse, and he sat on it, the one who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. He's not, no arrows are mentioned, no fighting is mentioned. He just goes and he conquers the world. He conquers the world not by fighting anybody. He goes and he just wins everybody over. Economically and politically, he just wins everybody over. He builds his economic base. He builds his military base. He, he does it from a position of peace. You say, how do you know that? Because, because of verse 4. When I, well, first let me read verse 3 first. And when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come, another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth. Well, you can't take peace from the earth if peace isn't already on the earth. This one who rode the horse, the white horse, established peace, peace treaties, whatever. People look to him as the one who could restore some kind of order to the world. But he's on a red horse in verse 4 to take peace from the earth that men would do what? Slay one another and a great sword was given to him. Red horse maybe depicting blood. I'm not trying to read more into this than is said there. But the point is, he was granted to take peace. And you, you, the way you take peace is you replace peace with war. Notice what he says, men will slay one another. Men will slay one another. A great sword was given to him. Turn to Revelation chapter 9. This is, that's the outset. That's the outset of this day of the Lord. That's initiated by God, given to this one who is on a white horse and a red horse. Look at Revelation 9. This is at the Euphrates River. Euphrates River runs from near Mount Ariat in Turkey all the way down to um, the Persian Gulf. About 1,700 mile river goes through uh, Iraq. So you're at the Euphrates River in this battle here. And notice what it says in verse 14. One saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Listen, you don't release, you don't bound holy angels. You bound fallen angels. And for some reason, you've got demons that have been bound at the north end of this Euphrates River for something that occurred there. I don't know. I just know God bounds fallen angels. I learned that in Peter and Jude. But at the impulse of the sovereignty of God, these demons are released and begin to inflict warfare upon the earth on those who have rejected his son. You see in verse 15, and the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year, God uses these evil angels to accomplish his divine purpose to kill a third of mankind. A third of mankind. To somehow a war is orchestrated here. And notice the huge army that comes in verse 16, 200 million. Wow. It's huge. 200 million was a number of them. And what's going to happen now, that river is going to be dried up, the Euphrates River is going to be dried up to make a natural highway for this army of 200 million to come further into the Middle East and to go 60 miles north of Jerusalem. Okay, let me show you that. Go to Revelation chapter 16. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river. 
the Euphrates and its water was dried up. That's what I just told you. Making a natural highway so that the kings from the east can march across it. You can look at a map. I'm not going to speculate on who the enemies are, but you've got a lot of the Arab world in this kings of the east. You've got countries all the way to the Pacific Ocean to the east, but they're all going to come crossing the Euphrates River, and they're going to end up 60 miles north of Jerusalem. Verse 13 says, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon... Are you all in Revelation 16? Yeah. Uh, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs for the spirits of demons performing signs which go out of the kings of uh, to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the almighty. God, God is setting up this war so that God can conquer these kings. Because that's what he's going to do. Verse 16, And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Mount Mageddon. We call it Armageddon. It's synonymous with the great battle that's going to take place there one day. 60 miles north of Jerusalem. I've been there. And looking at that valley, it's a flat region surrounded by far off Mountains like a huge coliseum with the mountains all around it. In the middle is going to be where that battle is going to take place one day. It's called Armageddon, 60 miles north of Jerusalem. Napoleon said it's the most natural battlefield he ever saw. Go to Revelation 19. You, you know, here, here's it. You see, can you see what's even happening in the world today? I'm not, I don't base my theology on newspaper headlines, okay? I'm not trying to do that. And I tell you, don't do that. But you know that every time somebody hiccups in the Middle East, the stock market goes down, right? There is so much unsettledness in that part of the world. Imagine when somebody actually does this stuff that everybody's fearing they're going to do. So it happens on a small scale all the time. Missiles and back and forth and... Revelation 19. Now this is where you come to the second coming of Christ. And it's interesting how 19 starts. And after these things, after the period of time called the tribulation, I believe it's seven years long, that period of time, this is what happens. And it happens at this battle of Armageddon. Notice in Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. Revelation 19, 11. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. This is the second, this is the culmination of this age. We have this age now and we have an age to come. Verse 14, the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, they come with him. Verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords and then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried out with a loud voice saying to all the birds listen to all the birds which fly in mid heaven come and assemble for supper so that you may eat the flesh of the kings and the flesh of the commanders and the flesh of the mighty men and the flesh of the horses and, the, and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, small and great. John MacArthur says that they're the largest bird migration in the world is in Israel. <laughs> what makes the gospel so appealing? The wrath of God is so horrible. It is so horrible. 
What makes the gospel good news? Because the wrath of God is such bad news. And then he says in verse 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized and the false prophet, these I read to you last week, the beast I believe is the antichrist. I believe the other beast is the false prophet who's gonna rise on that time. The false prophet is going to point everyone to the false religion of the beast, the antichrist. Remember I told you last week we were talking about false messiahs? It's going to increase. Well, this is the ultimate false messiah. This is the ultimate antichrist. We've had a lot of antichrist throughout history, but this is the ultimate one. And he is going to be judged in the end, thrown into verse, into verse 20, alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. The rest were killed with sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. That's the second sign. It precedes the second coming of Christ, wars and rumors of wars. Whatever wars have happened have, are nothing compared to the wars that await this world. Well, didn't get very far today, but it's okay. It's okay. We'll look, we'll look at the disturbances next week. This is just fun stuff, right? It's, you can hardly wait to get here. Famines? Earthquakes, disturbances, wild beast, just great sermon topics. I tell you what, that's the reason the gospel is so good, such good news. Get that, walk out here with that thought. If you've got to walk out with the thought, walk out with that thought. The wrath of God is so terrible. First Thessalonians says, it's Christ who saves you from the wrath to come. I don't want anybody I know to go through anything like this. I hope you feel the same way. God, use us as messengers of your good news. Use us as ambassadors for Christ because he is the only shield. We sang it. I love the songs we sang today. He is our shield. He is our refuge. Some of the verses we looked at earlier. He is our refuge. He's our shield and our refuge from the wrath of God, a a just and holy God. The reason God will pour his wrath out on you is because you are a sinner, and so am I. And unless I put my faith and trust in my sin bearer, Jesus Christ, the one who took my sin on himself in my place, I will have to pay for my own sin. So, trust Jesus. Hang on, he came to rescue. That's what he came on a rescue mission to rescue us from the impending wrath of God. He came to save us from God. Father, thank you for our time this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Just love you and praise you for your goodness. Your tr- your word, the power of your word that just penetrates our hearts. We love you in Christ's name. Amen.